Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning to those of you, um, I guess, west of, of the central time zone. Good afternoon to everyone in the central and eastern time zones. Um, um, I'd like to welcome everybody again. My name is Aaron Gelb. I'm a partner in Kahnmasil Carey's Chicago office, um, and I'll be joined today by my colleague Fern Fleischer Daves in a, in a panel of uh, experts who I think you'll, you'll be very interested uh, to hear from. Um, I wanted to just start, this is a special bonus webinar um, you know, for, for those of you that have been joining us regularly, uh, either in past years or, or so far this year, we've, we've already done a few. In the past, we've typically done one webinar a month, but with everything going on, uh, we thought that, that this would be a topic that was worth kind of shoehorning into the second half of February. Uh, hopefully most of you were able to join us uh, last week for the a, a related webinar on vaccines, which was what employers need to know about the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, and we thought this would be a helpful supplement to what was covered in that program. Um, and, and rather than, than just following on that with another um, lecture type format where you, you have uh, a handful of Conmasil Carey attorneys uh, kind of sharing their, their wisdom and, and, and information with you, we put together this panel um, of subject matter experts who will share their perspectives from the front lines. So um, I'm going to let everybody introduce themselves in a second. Um, I'll just again introduce uh, myself more formally. Uh, I'm the partner in charge of uh, the Chicago office where I oversee the firm's Midwest OSHA practice. Uh, handling all types and all manner of OSHA matters from inspections and incident responses throughout Region 5, um, as well as across the country. Um, I've been in practice for, uh, I think, over 25 years now. The uh, majority of that in Chicago spent a few years in St. Louis at the start of my career uh, in law school down in, uh, in Austin, University of Texas. So just wanted to give a shout out to, uh, to my friends and, and colleagues down there. I know it's been a tough time, and, and certainly I think everything that's going on with as far as the weather, um, both both the, the, the catastrophic cold and free, free freezing weather in, in Texas and, and throughout the South, uh, not to mention here in Chicago, we've had probably close to two feet of snow in the last week uh, in certain areas, which all of which can certainly impact and has impacted the vaccine rollout. Uh, so that's one of the things that we're going to talk about as well. Um, so Fern, I'll turn it to you to introduce yourself and then, then we'll, we'll move on to our panelists. Hi, my name is Fern Fleischer Daves and I am a regulatory and litigation attorney, uh, primarily environmental safety and health. And for the last year I've been uh, working intensively on COVID issues. And um, interestingly enough, I'm now an expert on vaccines. Um, <laughs> Uh, what's great about the COVID practice is it crosses uh, about 10 different statutes in, on the federal level and literally every day something is happening either in a state or county that is changing the advice that we've given clients the day before. So it's been a very exciting year. Um, I've previously been in-house at large and small companies and uh, so I have uh, maybe a unique perspective on some of these issues. Thanks, Fern. I think uh, we were joking the other day that you were the, the last person to run down the hall when the, the question of who wanted to handle the vaccine the vaccine issues came up. So, but we we you you've been a great resource in the, in that regard. So, thank you. Um, and then our panelists, what we tried to do in, in assembling the panel is is I mean, if if you think about this this effort of of trying to vaccinate an entire country, a uh, country as large as both in in, in terms of population size density, uh, but also the, the, the breadth of our country uh, and size of it, it it's, it's obviously no small undertaking. And um, we, we, we asked and we were very, very appreciative for the, the folks that have joined us today. Um, so Lori, I'll let you introduce yourself and then we'll move on to our, our friends from Walgreens. Sure, thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you all here today. I'll be with you here today. Uh, my name is Lori Freeman and I'm the CEO of NACHO, um, also known as the National Association of County and City Health Officials. I have been in this role um, just about three years, uh, but it represents a return for me. I had worked um, in a deputy role at this organization uh, from about 2010 to 14. 
Um, my career has been um, serving nonprofits and mostly in the medical and public health fields. And um, I've been the CEO of, of several nonprofits um, during my tenure as well, uh, but none of which is um, the mo most important role as I play today um, as a CEO of this organization at this moment in time. And um, I would say it's a, a, about a, a one in a hundred year chance that I would be running this organization during a pandemic. Um, and it's been a, a really um, a valuable, interesting, and very difficult experience. Uh, and I, I'm looking forward to sharing uh, more with you about NATO on today's webinar. Thank you yeah, so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. I think um, I, I know for those those that have listened to some of the, the other webinars that we've we've covered and where I've spoken, you know, we, we, we sort of joke that this pandemic has been, you know, the Super Bowl and World Series and and Final Four and whatever big sporting event you want to talk to rolled into one for OSHA lawyers, it, kind of our, our chance to, to to help make a difference. But I think that's kind of pales in comparison to to what your members are doing, uh, really on the truly on the front lines. And I, I think that uh, again, your your participation. Um, obviously, many of our most, if not all of our clients are dealing with, in some form or fashion, uh, a, a state, county or city health department, um, you know, whether it's contact tracing, whether it's notification, reporting, et cetera. So, so thank you again. Um, and, and so one of our uh, partners that we've really been working a lot together with, um, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Michelle to introduce herself and then uh, Sonali. Sure. Thanks so much, Erin, and uh, thank you for inviting me. You have definitely made a difference at Walgreens. Um, I have been with Walgreens for over 30 years, but the last 400 days plus have been focused uh, solely on COVID, um, both protecting our team members and customers, and now with the uh, launch of the vaccine. So we don't see um, a, a clear end in sight, um, but, but we're very privileged and honored to be uh, vaccinating the population of the US and supporting those activities. So I am the retail health and safety manager for Walgreens, um, primarily focused on reducing risk of injury from occurring either in the workplace or when you're uh, visiting Walgreens. Um, so we've been, um, we've been a department for about six years um, and really made a difference in, in reducing those risks, both to our team members and our customers. And so uh, we'll continue to do that throughout this vaccine as well. Thanks, Michelle. Mm -hmm. um, and then Sonali. Thank you, Aaron, and um, welcome everyone. I'm Sonali Shatria. I'm also uh, with Walgreens. I'm a pharmacist by trade and a manager in our Office of Clinical Integrity, which is a fancy way of saying that we also review clinical risk to Walgreens from products to marketing to programs. Um, I have over 20 years of experience in the delivery and development of clinical pharmacy programs, not all at Walgreens, but including immunizations. And I think that's already been alluded to that no amount of experience could prepare us for what the last year has brought. Um, so myself and other team members have been supporting Walgreens from a clinical perspective throughout this pandemic, um, and especially for the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines. So it is truly an all team effort. And I think, you know, as much information as you can take in about how to manage, navigate any piece of this pandemic that would help to improve health and safety for um, customers, patients, people is, is a really important task right now. So thank you for having me. Yes, thank you. And, and uh, appreciate the way that, that Walgreens has really led on this issue. And, and, and just to dispel any, any suspicions that folks may have, even, even as, as outside OSHA counsel to Walgreens, I'm still not vaccinated. So no, no special treatment is accorded uh, to counsel. You know, I think like many of us, we, we joke about, you know, waiting, waiting outside in case someone doesn't show up or, or one of those, those crazy stories. I know we've seen the the news reports of people being vaccinated in, in traffic jams caused by the weather. And, and um, I mean, obviously it's, it's all over the news as far as uh, I just, I saw something yesterday or I think in today's news about uh, some of the, the meat processing plants that are gonna be trying to stand up 
um, vaccine programs, another company that that has has been trying to dialogue with another uh, large pharmacy chain about setting up a vaccine program, and and a lot of it is still obviously very much up in the air. So what what we'll try to do then is first frame some of these issues just briefly. Uh, Fern's going to go through a, 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 a few slides with you all, and then we'll we'll shift into uh, the, the panel discussion where we'll, we'll ask some questions. I'll, I'll ask some questions of the panelists, um, primarily starting starting with Lori and then and then shifting to Michelle and Sonali. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely try to take questions as well. Uh, so if you can use your, your chat function uh, in the audience, please do. And, and we'll try to ask the, the questions that, that, that are appropriate for the panel and see if we can, can further uh, have, have some interesting dialogue. So Fern, I'll turn it over to you quickly and, um, hey. and then, then jump back in. So um, uh, uh, you can look at this uh, CDC website every day to see how many vaccines have been administered in each state and um, the number of people receiving uh, one dose and the number of people who received two doses. Um, 56 million is a pretty big number, um, but we've got a long way to go and uh, employers are gonna pay, play an important role uh, over the next few months in getting more people vaccinated, but this is really very exciting. You can go to you the have, next slide. Do you have any, any sense of, um, I mean, the numbers are pretty close between the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. Is yeah. It, is it kind of catch as catch can, or is there, you know, as far as which one you get, or how does that? So um, what I've seen is um, here in Houston, the hospitals are getting the Pfizer vaccine, and the city and county are getting the Moderna vaccine. I don't know how that's decided by the federal government. I know that, um, and maybe someone in Walgreens can comment on this, but um, uh, pharmacies are now getting direct shipments of the vaccine. I don't know which ones, and it may depend on the state. Um, it also has um, some, uh, some uh, variation depending on the availability of freezers because you need a different freezer for the Pfizer vaccine than you need for the Moderna vaccine. So, um, I really don't know, but that's a good question. Yeah, and I assume we'll we'll see the once the the J and J vaccine is approved that that will um, probably facilitate kind of some of these these secondary or tertiary locations, since that the storage issue is is apparently far less complex. Um, right. When you're, when you're talking about the type of deep freezers, and you're talking about um, from from a from a health and safety standpoint, as as we've seen and and been asked to advise certain clients, the dry the risks associated with dry ice, um, you know, for 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 those of you and I don't, I don't know if this was covered last week, but for those of you that, that that have dry ice or work with it, you know, hopefully everyone knows about the the both the the carbon dioxide risks, um, you know, which could be potentially life threatening, uh, to to obviously the burn risks associated with with touching the dry ice. Right. Um, so, all right. So, so I'm just going to go through this quickly. Some of you attended our um, seminar uh, last week, and some of this is uh, just uh, updated a little bit. Um, both of the vaccines available in the United States have emergency use authorization, and that emergency use authorization has some legal consequences, which we'll talk about a little bit. We know from uh, recent data that um, both vaccines. Um, are effective against um, both symptomatic illness and severe disease. If you do get sick, it's a small percentage of people who do get sick, but you won't get really, really sick um, if you've been vaccinated in most circumstances. There are isolated reports of individuals having COVID symptoms after vaccination and actually see a question in the chat about um, what to do in that circumstance. And um, there is some guidance from the CDC on what to do if someone has received the vaccination and has different symptoms. Um, not everybody has adopted the CDC guidelines, and we'll talk a little bit about that, how this is moving almost every day. The CDC publishes some advice. Some states adopt it. Some states don't. Sometimes Sometimes the states adopted in part, it's very confusing. This is really a state by state, county by county effort, which is why it's so difficult for big employers to manage their uh, COVID compliance issues. 
Um, we expect that one or two vaccines will be uh, uh, seek approval in the next month, and that's going to open up availability um, probably very substantially. And that patchwork that you you talk about is you know we as as I assume that many of our listeners know we are are leading an effort and assembling a coalition to to comment on the anticipated COVID standard that, that we expect OSHA to be issuing, uh, and certainly that is one of the, the the issues that I think concerns many people. Um, and, and and whether there is kind of light at the end of that tunnel or a solution or, or at least a re some, some relief on that issue, just, just know that that is, you're not alone if you're struggling in that regard. And, and, and we, are, we are trying to make a difference in, in, in that area. So um, there is a uh, really interesting document that was issued by the Biden administration a few weeks ago. It's the, called the National COVID-19 Strategy. And it, buried in this document, I think on pages 89 and 90, um, is a goal to create conditions for worker vaccination through a national employer pledge. Now, the president hasn't said they're going to force every employer to provide vaccines, but um, as a matter of policy, no worker should have to choose between working and earning a paycheck and getting their vaccine. Um, they're looking for employers to voluntarily state that employees will be able to use time off um, in order to get the vaccine. In some places, you have to wait in line for hours. It's not so easy. It'll get better in the coming months, but right now, if you qualify um, and you can get an appointment and you can get to the place where they're giving vaccines, it's possible to wait several hours. And not everybody has the ability to take two or three hours or four hours off from work. They may not be able to get childcare. It's complicated. And employers have an important role to play here. Um, and we expect to hear more from the administration on this initiative in the coming weeks. So in every state, the state legislature or the governor has appointed a committee of people who are experts in this field and they've determined eligibility based on age, health and what your job is. That being said, it differs, differs state to state and you could be a, an essential worker as a farm worker in one state or one county and not be an essential worker in another county or another state. It's very confusing. There are websites that will help you navigate this. And if you're interested afterwards, send me an email and I'll be able to uh, show you the websites where you can look this up. It is also changing in the state of New York. Um, they had a plan that was issued in September, it was changed in December, and it was changed, I think, twice since then, where they've had teachers as essential workers and EMTs as essential workers. Um, the number of states that have identified people with pre-existing conditions, that list of pre-existing conditions is different from state to state. So you really need to navigate this on a local level, which is confusing. Um, in some places, Last minute signups are available, but if you don't have a smartphone or, or really good computer uh, internet service, you are left out of out left out in the cold. I'm in Houston. Um, or, or you are left out of this anybody. process in most states um, unless you can get to uh, the information number for the local health department. A lot of health departments have a special number for people who are elderly who don't have internet service. There are a few places where computer bots have, have uh, popped up, where volunteers have basically programmed the ability to search every uh, vaccination site in a particular county or a particular area and direct you to the places that might have an open uh, appointment today or tomorrow. Uh, very, very complicated. We're hopeful this is gonna get easier, but right now, um, at least in, in Houston, you can sign up with the county, you can sign up with the state, you can sign up with three different grocery store uh, chains, three different pharmacy chains, but you have to do each thing individually, which is very burdensome. Um, so we're hopeful that that will get better in the coming months. And I'm, I'm sure everybody will be thrilled to know that lawyers are considered essential workers here in Illinois. So, you know, or, yes, uh, lawyers are essential lawyers in Illinois, in Virginia, in Maryland, 
but not in Washington, D.C. So um, uh, there are um, some instances where court employees are being vaccinated at the courthouse through the health department, um, and they're making that available um, if you have to go to court. There are criminal um, uh, proceedings happening in most states. Um, I don't know how soon that's going to happen in a lot of places. Um, teachers are eligible in about half the states right now. Um, so just as an example, um, a few weeks ago, uh, the CDC issued guidance that says if you've been vaccinated and then you're exposed to someone, you don't have to quarantine under certain circumstances. California adopted this almost immediately, posted it on their website. I've checked at least a dozen states on this particular issue. Some states have adopted the CDC's guidance completely. Some states have adopted it in part. Some states plan to, but they haven't um, posted that. So this morning I was on uh, the telephone for about 45 minutes with the state of New Mexico trying to find out if they're going to adopt this new CDC guidance. And they said, yeah, well, we're going to do that, but we haven't posted it. And I said, well, how is an employer supposed to know what to do? And they said, well, you can call me back. My name is Mike. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is tough stuff. It's a little bit different than how lawyers are, are used to operating. We're <laughs> We're citing a uh, a case law with a with a page page reference uh, as opposed to citing to to Mike, so that's the world we live in right now. I think so. Um, I mentioned some of these uh, challenges to vaccine access, lack of internet service. Some people don't have a smartphone. My mother, who's eighty, who still works, would never be able to do this on her own. Um, some people don't have transportation to the vaccination sites. In some communities, um, Uber and Lyft are giving free transportation to elderly people who, who need to get to a vaccination site at the public health department. There are language barriers. There are a lot of cultural issues around hesitancy. Some of you may be tackling that with your workforce. Um, and then mobility. If you have temporary workers, um, they may get vaccinated with their first shot, but then who's going to track them to get the second shot? That's not really clear yet. So what about the good news? Um, really good news. Lots of new tests have been approved. Uh, there are a couple of tests that you can use at home. I know a couple of employers who've actually purchased these quick, inexpensive home tests, and they've made them available to their employees. So if they have an instance where there's been an exposure in the workplace, the employees already have the test kit at home and they can test themselves before coming back to work. Um, we expect new vaccines to be approved soon. There's tons of new safety data from studies in the US and in other countries. And there are at least five or six uh, webs, uh, web developers that are looking at vaccination passports where you'll have a, a QR code on your phone that indicates that you've been vaccinated and it will be secure. It will be used for international travel, for sports venues, for concerts, and possibly even for restaurants eventually. Um, there are a number of uh, experimental programs uh, in the US and abroad where they're training dogs to sniff you to see if you might be um, currently uh, uh, exposed to the vaccine. Um, I hear that these are successful and they're being used in a couple of international airports. And I heard that possibly the NBA and the NFL will eventually be using this to screen people who want to go to uh, sports um, activities. And there are a lot of new technologies out there. Um, the coolest thing I've seen so far this week was a new test that has comes in the mail in a box and it has a little device that's about this big and it wirelessly connects to your phone and it's got um, a Q-tip in the box and you swab your nose and you put the Q-tip into a card and then you insert the card into this device and in 10 or 15 minutes, you know if you're positive or not. Pretty cool. And it costs about $25, $30. And as those roll out, probably the cost will come down too. So there's a lot of exciting new technology to, to look at. 
So uh, important takeaways. Um, vaccines will prevent most but not all infections. So it is not a replacement for all the things that you're already doing in your workplace. Cleaning and disinfecting, social distancing, hand hygiene, wearing layered face coverings. Um, I talked to an employer last week who said they've just instituted double masking in their workplaces. Um, that's gonna continue for a long time. Um, vaccinations are great, but these other things have to continue. The vaccines will reduce symptoms and deaths. They will reduce the need for quarantines. Um, we still don't know um, whether or not the vaccine will prevent transmission so that if you're exposed, even if you don't get sick, can you give it to other people? That all being said, employers have a really important role in the vaccine rollout. All right, thanks, Fern. I think I'll go back to uh, the map just because just I some interesting data in there. So, so let's get let's uh, let's start our panel discussion. Uh, as I mentioned, I think we'll we'll start with Lori um, to 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 get your your perspective. Um, maybe Lori, if you could could talk a little bit about the role that Nacho is playing in the the rollout process generally to to give uh, give some give our listeners a, a sense of of that aspect. Sure, happy to. So, um, so Nature represents the nearly 3,000 county and city health departments across the country. Um, and our role as a national organization is obviously to be their voice um, and to elevate their issues and concerns and to liaison um, with the federal government, uh, other agencies and partners at the national level to ensure um, that, that the interests of local community public health is represented and, and that they are engaged. Um, as part of the vaccine process, our local health departments are part of the federal public health system. Um, uh, the HHS, CDC, down to the states and down through to the um, city and county levels. Um, our health departments in non-pandemic times usually um, inoculate about 80% of their communities. Um, or, or they, their, their main, one of their main functions in normal times is to provide vaccination um, and immunization uh, for children and adults. Um, they are well prepared to implement this vaccination effort for our country, but this is the first time we've had to actually um, immunize in our entire country, our 330 million people. So our local health departments cannot do everything, um, but they are positioned and have plans in place um, to, to execute successful vaccination of their communities um, with other partners. Um, such as the private community as well. What are what are some of the numbers that you, in terms of just to maybe for a frame of reference, you know, take take like a flu vaccine. Um, what what's that? How does that scope? I mean, as you said, you know, vaccinating an entire country. Because I I, I, mm -hmm. I know flu vaccine compliance is probably a good bit lower. Um, it is, um, it is, and, and keep in mind, you know, we're doing flu vaccine on top of COVID vaccine at this time. Um, I don't have specific um, numbers uh, in total of the, the yearly um, vaccinations given by local health departments. We only know that 80% that of them provide vaccination to their communities and um, and play a really important role in reaching uh, really hard to reach uh, populations in their communities, ones that are most at risk, um, ones that are um, most vulnerable to disease transmission and, um, and or underlying conditions, those chronic conditions that um, coupled with COVID um, can really uh, cause the poorest outcomes. Um, but they are getting vaccines. Um, the challenge is um, uh, when we think about the local health department are that um, there's not enough vaccine as you've all said and that we know. Right now, uh, states are, um, there, there are multiple channels flowing um, with vaccine into communities at this time. Um, the federal public health system uh, flows vaccine based on population. Um, uh, it's a population based algorithm to every state. 
And then every state has a responsibility to allocate further to their local health departments. Also, um, a large uh, majority of those need population-based allocations down to the local level. However, some states, um, and it does vary, uh, like, it, like you mentioned, it varies um, from state to state and other aspects of this response. Uh, some states are, are also layering upon uh, population-based um, uh, something called the social vulnerability index, which allows them to really target vaccine into those communities that are most at risk that I just mentioned. There's about 13 and a half million doses going per week at this time to the states um, to allocate. And that um, level of vaccine is expected to increase over time. Um, right now, um, we work very closely with the White House every week to, for full awareness and visibility that we can share um, information and data with our local health departments on what to expect. Um, the, there isn't enough vaccine um, is, is one issue. Um, another um, complication here is that uh, in an effort to uh, sort of address the vaccine um, distribution uh, from a more macro perspective beyond the public health system, there are different channels of distribution in place right now. You've, you've mentioned the pharmacy, federal pharmacy program. Those pharmacy programs um, are pre-registered and they receive, um, they've received 1 million doses per week. They're about to jump to $2 million or 2 million doses per week. Um, there are also direct distributions to certain federal agencies like the prison um, system, uh, the Veterans uh, Administration, um, areas like that receive direct distribution from our government, as well as um, federally qualified health centers or another distribution channel. So in summary, you know, there's a lot of different channels going into the community. And one of our largest sort of um, hurdles at this point is understanding how much vaccine is coming into the community at that level from all these different sources and then um, really having a comprehensive response in the community to make sure that we are addressing the special populations that need the most help. Yeah, that's interesting. I think that the this the the channels aspect is probably something that's that's it's it's something of a black box for for most people out there that that you know you 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 ha you can picture in your your mind's eye certainly for our manufacturing clients that, that you've got the Pfizer facilities and the Moderna facilities that are cranking out the vaccines and and then they're they're getting it ready for shipment and then the the various logistics companies come with their trucks and drive them away and they perhaps where they get on an airplane and and they're, they're putting the cargo hold and they're shipped um and then and then they reach those those endpoints do you do you have any sense or can you share as far as who who decides uh, how, you know when a when a crate say is ready or a box is ready and it's going out like, who's deciding which channel it goes into is that is that a decision being made by presumably i guess by the federal government at this point yeah well yes um so at the federal level they're determining these sort of um uh, pipelines into the communities um through these various channels that i mentioned um on the public health system side once those vaccines hit the state, the state controls um, the distribution and where those go and that they can use um, uh, a number, a variety of different, you know, mechanisms to determine how to get those vaccines locally. Um, uh, there was a, a comment or a question earlier. Right now, those, those distributions occurring through the public health system to the states are 50-50. They're 50% 50 Pfizer, they're 50% Moderna. Um, and we don't expect that to change significantly in the coming weeks. Um, uh, but when it, that's an important sort of thing to note because states in their um, decision making uh, may have to make dis different decisions about that Pfizer vaccine due to the special handling of it versus mm -hmm. the Moderna. And um, we can easily see where the decision um, uh, point would take place. More rural communities, for example, um, may not have the capacity or the means to handle the Pfizer 
uh, vaccine. So it's nice that the states have a 50-50 allocation. They might be able to push the Moderna into the areas that don't have the capacity or the refrigeration um, freezer mechanisms um, uh, uh, and that sort of thing and push the Pfizer vaccine into the more, more urban areas that might have more resources. Yeah, thank you. That's a, I think that's an interesting point, um, and and it probably bears emphasizing that that your members, the the various city, county health departments, they they're not deciding how much they get, or they're you know they're basically given whatever it is that their state, the state in which they are operating, whether it's the governor's office or, or whomever, allocates to them. Is that is that correct? Yes, and um, and it's hard. It's hard because, um, well, leading up to the the change of administration, there, um, and early on in the um, vaccine um, distribution effort, there was absolutely no visibility from week to week on on the number of doses that um, would reach communities. Um, and in, at the same time, local health departments were trying to plan mass va vaccination clinics, do scheduling take reservations. Um, now, um, at least with um, the new administration, they've made a commitment to, um, to have a three week window at all times. So whatever you're getting this week, you can count on for the next three weeks and that number keeps going up over time. And that's really been helpful in helping local health departments to plan for their, their local distribution on the ground. Other than that, it becomes very hard because there's there's a more of a demand um, than there is supply, of course. Um, that will change over time, and we have concerns about that even. Um, the more vaccine, the less people might be, uh, might get it. <laughs> um, you know, the more it's scarce, uh, creates this demand that, um, you know, people are anxious to get it. So we worry about that a little bit as well. Yeah, it's kind of sort of like the the, the hot ticket once it's, yeah. it's everywhere. Yeah, everyone's not not as enthused about it. Um, you mentioned the special special handling aspects, and I think I think most people are are prob have probably heard to some extent about the the, the refrigeration or freezing requirements with respect to certainly the Pfizer vaccine. Is, is that is that something? Do most health departments have the the sort of infrastructure or equipment? That, where they can handle that, or is that more even more so hospitals only, that are, are limited to that that sort of technology? So some of your larger, um, more urban, in some suburban um, health departments will have that capacity um, in that equipment. Um, but the the more rural you get, um, the geographically dispersed you get, the less likely that is to occur. And, you know, the federal government, the CDC uh, made it clear from the beginning, don't don't rush out and start buying deep freezers. You know, there'll be different types of vaccines coming. Some will re have different requirements um, and, and, you know, we'll be able to distribute hopefully just based on what you're able to accommodate in your uh, community. So um, uh, the supply, it, it, we haven't heard as much about that being a problem with the, um, the addition of the Moderna vaccine and with Johnson & Johnson coming on the heels of that very soon, one dose vaccine, um, the, that will, it will continue to alleviate that problem of equipment um, moving forward. But I will say that just in general, our local health departments are uh, have long suffered from just disinvestment in public health in general. It put us at a, a real disadvantage coming into this pandemic in, in our ability to respond. Um, and so, you know, uh, NATO's is working very hard to advocate for um, that reinvestment in public health so that we're ready for the next time. Right, and I think that that's a good segue to another another challenge. So there's, there's the the, the aspect of having enough shots to put in arms, but then the question of, do you have enough uh, hands to, to push the, the syringe in, in terms of, do you have vaccine, you may have situations where there is vaccine, but not enough vaccinators. Um, is, that, is that something that you are seeing? And if so, is that improving? Well, workforce is definitely challenging. Um, and to that same point that I just made about the, the public health investment, um, Workforce over the past decade in public health has de um, reduced by 20%, partly due to that disinvestment in public health. 
Um, so workers are um, at a premium. And we saw this in the early stages of the pandemic, contact tracing and testing um, with, with workforce shortages. Um, two things that will help alleviate that. First of all, um, the Biden administration's commitment to invest in a, a public health um, service core of 100,000 workers is something that is underway at this moment. We're working with the, the Biden administration um, closely to, to help identify what that looks like that will help ramp things up. The second thing that's more immediate that's important to note is state by state, you're seeing states change um, their, their, some of their roles on, um, on licensing um, professionals um, to, to be vaccinators. And so some of the allied health fields um, that might have been restricted um, because they didn't have um, the licensing issues were not quite in place to allow them to, um, to come forward to be vaccinators are, are changing temporarily during pandemic to allow that. And then um, uh, more recently, um, there may be an effort underway by the federal government to help with that as well in terms of um, helping identify other groups of allied health workers who could um, be ramped up to be vaccinators through a quick meeting with the CDC. Great. All right. Thank you. Uh, so I think probably last question, then I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'll switch gears to, to, I'll talk to the folks from Walgreens. Is there anything from, from your perspective, from Nature's perspective, that employers can do to, to help in their communities? Well, this public-private partnership is going to be more important than ever. We need all hands on deck um, with this pandemic. Uh, public health can't do this alone. Um, and, and the more um, partners we have, the better. Um, so we will see... Um, in, in communities, um, we're beginning to see corp, uh, companies step up. Um, and uh, for example, well, we have the pharmacy partnership in place, which is great. And folks like the Walgreens and um, the Walmarts and the CVSs of the world are, are all on board um, with helping to get this country vaccinated. Uh, and, but beyond that, even places like Major League Baseball are stepping up to offer their stadiums to our local health departments as mass vaccination and testing sites. The NFL is right behind them. Um, those are great examples. I think um, in, in the world of, of, of corporate um, responsibility, if you will, um, we'll need your help to get the messaging across to employees um, that really vaccinating is going to keep you safe and anything um, that companies can do to support that effort will be welcome. So, and lastly, the more vaccine that becomes available, eventually we will have more vaccine than, uh, than we possibly need. And I think at that stage of the game, um, we'll begin to see um, things happen like uh, maybe corporate vaccination sites and things like that. Right now, that can't happen just because of the scarcity of the vaccine. But over time, I think we'll want everybody on deck uh, to help vaccinate uh, the workforce. Yeah. <clears throat> maybe maybe we can convince certain certain baseball teams to offer uh, free free admission with uh, if you get vaccine get get uh, vaccinated <laughs> yeah. at the gate. So Come might, see might, a ball game and get vaccinated. Right. There there may be some teams that need to do that to get get <laughs> yeah. uh, through the turnstiles. Um, so. All right, so so thank you, Lori, um, and and feel free to jump in if you you know obviously if you hear something or you want to add something and and, and continue the discussion. So, um, Michelle, one of one of my favorite channel distribution channels are our friends at at, at Walgreens. Um, I mean, you and I have been um, we've been working together for a while on a number of issues. What what are the 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 challenges that that you're seeing from from a pharmacy standpoint uh, in, in terms of, of, of this rollout. Yeah, thanks, Erin. And um, I enjoy our partnership as well, but I also don't have the vaccine. So um, <laughs> when I get it, I'll let you know. <laughs> um, I don't know that we're necessarily facing challenges. We are exposed to new things with this vaccine compared to the other ones we currently administer. Um, for example, from my perspective in safety, um, the COVID vaccine is so different in, as far as the storage and the ultra cold storage environment. Um, so handling dry ice is very new to our pharmacies 
And early on, we knew that dry ice was gonna be required. Um, so the first thing was trying to onboard and locate new suppliers for all the new required PPE that we didn't currently have. So cryogenic gloves and safety goggles and safety glasses and um, CO2 carbon dioxide monitors for these pharmacy spaces. And I have to say it was um, stressful, it was long, but it was heartwarming and, and gave you a lot of positive uh, faith in our country because every supplier we worked with did everything they could um, to come through for us because they knew what Walgreens was gonna provide to the United States. So it was, while it was tough, it was also heartwarming and very nice to see. So um, I would say probably if you're gonna call it a challenge, it was being faced with those new items that we hadn't experienced before, um, but not much, not much different. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's a you know you 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 raise a good point. I mean, supply chains are 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 are, are such a, a significant focus right now. Whether it's as Fern talked about testing or or PPE, obviously uh, masks and things like that. But even uh, when you've talked about the the dry ice and the and the PPE that goes with that, but also uh, the needles that that are going to be needed to to get. So we we when you think about each step of the process, and it really can be broken down into so many kind of smaller, discrete parts. Um, so get getting it produced, getting it shipped, getting it stored, getting getting the people who push who push the syringe into your arm. But then make, making sure that there is so you, you can have the vaccine, but you don't have the syringes uh, because there is there's even scarcity of supply with that. And and I, I think at least from my perspective, one of the real challenges of, in terms of getting people to to focus on or understand what we're up against is is that there was such a focus on creating the vaccine and 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 the amazing speed at which companies like Pfizer and Moderna and Johnson and Johnson have all done that, which is 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 amazing. Um, it, it's probably human nature to think, well, we've got the vaccine, we're good. Um, <laughs> and not, not necessarily picking up on each little point in the process where you could, you can have that, that, that chain interrupted. Um, so even if it is just, we don't have a needle, you know, we've got the vaccine, we've got the person, we got the person, the arm to put it in, but we don't have a way to get it in there. Yeah. Um, so I as far as, um, I, I don't know if you're able to talk. I mean, it's obviously very, very current events and, and still ongoing. Um, but, but how how has this this recent uh, kind of catastrophic weather impacted things, if at all, from from your on your side of things? Yeah. So um, I know it's in the media a lot now, but even before the COVID vaccine, we have refrigerated medications in our freezers and our refrigerators. And we're in all 50 states plus Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. So we've had plenty of power outages due to hurricanes and other weather events um, where the product inside that equipment, the refrigerators or freezers um, needed to be secured and, and ensure that we maintain that cold chain requirement for that particular medication. So we have a standard process that we follow. We have a business continuity plan. Um, we have suppliers and vendors on standby um, to be able to dispatch generators um, as soon as we call them. And the same thing happened with this COVID vaccine. We know which stores have the equipment. We notified, it, uh, notified our vendors well ahead of time um, months ago to say, these are the stores that we're gonna need you to be um, available to dispatch a generator at, need, is, at the last minute, you know, as soon as possible. So we did have one power outage in Ohio early this year, um, and that store did have an ultra cold freezer. And the vendor was notified and got the generator there within two hours and the product maintained the ultra cold temperatures. So we do the same thing in Houston. Um, the challenge is it's taking a little longer to get the generator there due to the slick roads, um, but we have contingency plans. We do have dry ice that doesn't need power. Um, so, so we keep the vaccine cold on the dry ice and monitor that temperature remotely. Um, so, while it's difficult and while it's gotten a lot of news attention, it's pretty standard business for us because we operate in those type of environments um, all the time. 
That's a, yeah, I think that's an interesting sort of, uh, I guess, behind the behind the curtain uh, sort of pers perspective that I, hopefully people will, will find uh, illuminating. I know from uh, talking to one one big box retailer about is I think you referenced, you know, the, the hurricane that hit Puerto Rico a number of years ago. I mean, the, 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 a lot of the very, very large companies even have their own internal weather tracking uh, uh, systems. So they're they're preparing and, 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 and planning for those, those sorts of, uh, those sorts of, of incidents. So, um, so that last question for you, Michelle, um, having gone through, and I think you've touched on this a little bit, but, but if you had had any thoughts or, or advice for any employers um, that, that, that might be considering kind of trying to stand up their own vaccination program or site. I know, as Lori said, we're not quite there yet uh, due to supply, but but maybe some lessons learned or some 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 advice uh, from, from what you've done. Yeah, so totally agree with Lori. Jurisdictions are not currently allocating any vaccine to Walgreens uh, for contracting with or servicing employers that have eligible populations. Um, we don't have direct access to the vaccine. We do this today with our flu shot. We go on site to many different employers with our flu shot, but it's our inventory and we can do with it what we want. This is new in that it's not ours. We're, we're kind of the intermediate intermediary who is distributing it and administrating it, but somebody else is telling us what to do with it for now. Um, I don't foresee that always being that way, but for now, that's what we're, we're faced with. Um, I guess my advice is to partner with someone early on, but also understand as an employer what your potential um, responsibility and liability will be if you want to house this in your facility. Um, that is difficult. Um, we're challenged with it um, with ultra cold even though, like I said, we already store vaccines and different medications in temperature monitored equipment. This just made it that much more um, important to people and they're more conscious of it um, because it's so important to the country. So understand if that's something you wanna do is to house it yourself. Otherwise partner with somebody early on, build that relationship, understand what options may be available. We could possibly come on site in the future or you could have a, a potential voucher program that you hand a voucher to your employees who could come to our pharmacies. Um, and receive the vaccine. Um, but a lot of different options. It's just a little early in the process right now because nothing has been allocated um, to allow us to work through those steps and reach out to different employers. Interesting, thank you. Yeah, it, it seems like you, you could have stored the vaccine on our, our back deck in the last few weeks <laughs> here in <great>. Chicago. <laughs> uh, one day it's gonna warm up, I'm sure. Um, I hope. Uh, so, so Sonali, I, th I think you're, uh, give, given your background in, 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 in pharmacy, as a pharmacist, pharmacy manager, I, I, I think your perspective, we'd, we'd love to hear your thoughts on, on, on these issues from, from that perspective. Sure, absolutely. So I think outside of all of the issues we've heard about that Michelle and Fern and Lori have, have alluded to in terms of supply and transport and logistics, I think by the time it gets to our pharmacists and to the vaccinators, I mean, we're clinicians. So what we want is to immunize as many people as possible and get vaccine in arm. And so any barrier that prevents that from happening is really um, challenging in terms of how we manage from there on out. The other piece is, we're the accessible face. We're the voice and the, you know, the voice of truth from information sources that may not be accurate or that may be confusing. We can hear all the confusion that's going on out there. So I think, you know, first and foremost, it's, it's anything that gets in the way of being able to provide vaccine, which we've heard there's so many different barriers. And then it's the education piece. So pharmacists are again, accessible, one of the top five trusted professions in the nation. And so you leveraging that trust, I think has been really important and want to service to be able to give the right information in a world and environment where there is so much misinformation. Um, and so I think kind of sorting through the weeds has been a really important role um, trying to get this public health effort. So I think after the logistics of what we're talking about, where we're in a place where 
the vaccine can be available to most, then we can start talking about hesitancy and those who are concerned about getting it because right now everyone at the gate is just anxious to get it. So I think that that's as a clinician, a really important kind of it, it's in our blood, you know? Yeah. I think that that kind of ties back to what, what, what Lori was talking about in terms of right now, the people, there, there are people that are essentially are literally beating down the doors because they want it. So there's no hesitancy in this cohort of people that are, are seeking the vaccine. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, anecdotally, just walking down the street past a, a Walgreens and then hear a guy on the phone like they're not they don't have them at this, this <laughs> yes. store, but I, I hear up in Highland Park, if you can get up there in half an hour, you can go, you know, so that 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 sort of of uh, that will that will change. Um, glad to hear that 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 y'all are in the, the top five, probably a little bit higher than lawyers in terms of most trusted <laughs> professions. So we'll, neck and neck we'll, probably. we'll see that to you. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think one one thing that 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 maybe some people or, or many people are familiar with, but I, I assume not all, is, is the effort that Walgreens and has gone through uh, the initiative to, to getting the vaccines in arms within uh, the, the residential, uh, the older, the, the elderly population and going to actual nursing homes. Maybe you could, you could talk a little bit about that, that initiative to give people a sense of, of what you all have been doing. Sure, yeah, absolutely. So early on in this um, vaccination kind of campaign uh, back in December, um, the Operation Warp Speed goal was to get vaccine out as you know swiftly and safely as possible. And so in conjunction with the Department of uh, Health and Human Services and the Department of Defense, um, Walgreens was chosen as one of the two providers to COVID-19 vaccines within long-term care facilities for both staff and residents. So um, literally the day that vaccine was approved, uh, the next day, supply was being allocated specifically to our uh, designated sites, and then we coordinated efforts to get into those facilities. So, I mean, I have a, some recent stats. So through since December, um, it's been an ongoing effort. I think first doses. So our commitment was for three on-site visits, and that's to catch, you know, the vaccines available today are two dose. So that catches um, first dose and second dose, and then a potential third opportunity for those who may have been missed in those first two. Um, and so to date, we've administered over 2 million, it's 2.3 million uh, doses within the long-term care facilities. Overall, just a little bit over 3 million. So really a lot of learnings from that experience, um, a lot of challenges, barriers, but really wanted to get involved with vaccinating the most vulnerable population. And, you know, one of the things we did learn is the hesitancy piece kind of early on, too. So what was interesting is um, CDC published some some numbers about the hesitancy amongst the staff within those facilities. And so a lot of our work recently has been kind of educating the staff in terms of of addressing some of those issues. Yeah, that's a good point. I saw I saw in the news today that a, a, it's made the news a, a, a server in a restaurant in Brooklyn that was terminated because she she refused to get vaccinated. So I think we're going to see probably a lot a lot more stories um, like that. You know, it, it, when when you talk about hesitancy, it also it, it reminds me of, of you know I've seen people both just people talking to me, clients of mine who, who have been fortunate enough to be vaccinated. You know, there is that handful of people that, that experience what seems like a, a serious, although not long, long lasting reaction to it, which I think some people then, you know, that when those, there's debate about the, the, the benefits or the harm of sharing even that, that sort of story, because it may scare other people uh, from, from having the vaccine. Um, but the article I read, I thought was was very interesting, and I'm sure I, I wouldn't do it justice since I'm I'm not a I'm not a clinician. Um, but maybe I don't know if you're able to talk just briefly about you know why you might have you know pain in the arm or certain certain symptoms and and what how that means that the vaccine is really working because your body is is attuned to that threat. Um, sure. So side effects are typical with most drugs, vaccines, et cetera. So obviously there is a little, there's more awareness around the side effects that could potentially happen with COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, what we do know, what, we, what was shown in studies and what has been shown post studies is most of those side effects are minor or short-lived. So either closely after you get vaccinated and then perhaps you know with the second dose, there's a risk of slightly increased numbers or severity of those effects. And so that's essentially your body's 
building up of the immunogenic response to the to the vaccine that's been injected. So it, the idea is that um, as this immune your immune system is kind of ramping up, there is a risk that some of these side effects will occur. I think the challenge is when they mimic symptoms that we've been screening for for the entire year and how do you address some of that going forward. But what we've seen so far is that the side effects are minimal um, and minor and can be typically treated at home with some over-the-counter um, pain relievers or fever reducers and just ex knowing what to expect. I think it's more concerning when you don't know what to expect um, following the following the vaccination. So I think that that education piece um, is really important yeah, for understanding. That, yeah, that's a good that's a good point. I think that from from the articles that I had, had read about that, um, and I think it, as you said, it really ties to this second dose. And it's what the what the way I saw it characterized was that this this second dose is kind of is this essentially the signal to your immune system that this is a really serious threat. And, and that's, or at least that's how it's interpreted by the immune system. Like th this, this foreign body was introduced here a week, you know, two, what was it, uh, you know, two weeks ago or a month ago. And here it's again here. So we really need to, we, the immune system really need to take this seriously. And that's why some people might experience that, 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 short-lived re response that it might be a fever, it might be some serious aches. The, the, the very few clients of, or friends of mine who, who said that, you know, it sounded like a flu, but it, in, in all cases, it was gone within 12 to 24 hours. Yeah. And I think it's a balance of risk and benefit too. So I think that the idea is the risks of these effects are far are outweighed by the benefits of vaccination. Yeah, I think I think that's uh, I think that's a pretty pretty good way to put it. I I know I will I would gladly trade uh, a, a day of, of 101 fever, aches and pains in exchange for for not not being intubated or put on a ventilator in the future. Sure. Um, uh, so um, I, I think I want just kind of obviously since many of of, of our audience are are members of the regulated community, employers that are, are, are looking to do the right thing for their, their employees. Um, is, is there, uh, do you see a potential that, that efforts like what, what Walgreens has done uh, in the nursing homes is something that could be expanded to, to the private sector, to, to workforces, is it consistent with what, what Lori and Michelle said in terms of a yeah. supply? Yeah, I think it is consistent with what they're saying and is really a, one kind of dependent on what, when we get to a point when supply is allowed for it. We're already working on those efforts um, and building that because we do anticipate that that will be a part of um, increasing access. Uh, we already do it today with our flu program. And so it's, it's kind of a natural progression of what would happen next. Uh, but there's a few a few milestones to get through first. Um, and I think eventually what we'll see is kind of a test, vaccinate, treat, like kind of a, um, a multi-layered program, which we're already doing some on-site on workplace testing. Um, and then that would be a companion with vaccination. So we're not quite there yet, again, because of some of the nuances, but I, I envision that as soon as the other nuances are um, attested to that we would be able to move forward with that. Yeah, and the flu, I think from, from uh, I'm sure you'd know better than me, the flu, some stats that I saw regarding the flu this year were fascinating. I mean, obviously, <laughs> I, you know, many of us are, are, are confined to our home offices, uh, you know, AKA corner of the bedroom. Um, many of us are not, I, I used to take public transportation every day, which I'm sure standing in, a, in an L car in Chicago in January with a bunch of people that are coughing and, and touching the, the, the poles and the straps. Obviously that, that exposure is down, um, but the, the, the amount of, or the extent of the decrease was pretty, pretty eye-opening to me. I think I had read somewhere that there was only one, one young person that died of the flu this year or something pretty staggering. Um, so, uh, and, and I, I assume there's probably been some up, uptick in the percentage of people who got the flu vaccine this year as well. Yeah, we saw a reactive um, a reaction to that early in the season and whether it was out of concern of the, what they were calling the twindemic. Um, but it, I think it's a proven point that these basic infection control measures work, right? Social distancing, um, staying home when you're sick, being kind of self-aware of symptoms and removing yourself as a risk when those symptoms are there. It's, it, they work. Yeah, I think, I know, Fern, Fern you mentioned this about obviously the, the continued adherence to, to masking. I think we're, you know, looking at at the COVID uh, standard that we expect OSHA to issue. Certainly, I, I expect to see a continued emphasis or requirement to, to have either masking or perhaps even double masking. 
Uh, and I, I can certainly share with everyone who's listening, those clients of mine that, that early on experienced significant outbreaks that then uh, really went hardcore into masking saw incredible differences in the numbers. So, um, you know, hopefully there, hopefully there aren't too many mask skeptics left, but, but it definitely, uh, it definitely has worked from the clients that I've, I've, I've uh, coordinated with. So last, so the last question for you, sure. I think maybe that will be a particular interest to many, many of our, our listeners. Um, as, as the federal government begins allocating more, uh, doses to the pharmacies any any uh, advice or, or kind of overview of what how, how people can go and, and sign up either at, at Walgreens or generally yeah so I mean we've talked about the nuances of signing up and kind of uh, what the challenges of that are but you know ultimately we're, we're doing everything we can to make it as easy as possible so awareness of different options for vaccination are important. I think just, you know, a statistic to keep in mind is like pharmacies, for example, will probably vaccinate about 10 to 15% of the population. And of the eligible population today, about 10% of doses are available. So you kind of put those numbers together. I mean, I kind of liken it to like Black Friday, you know, looking for something that might be challenging. I think it's just to set yourself up for what the expectation should be, um, but not to give up. So I think it's it's staying on top of it, um, advocating, getting, you know, support. I think these spreading the news type um, channels are, are great. It, share information when you have it accessible. Um, but we're, we're making, you know, from a Walgreens perspective, we're making digital updates constantly to make it as easy as possible. We're also looking at different models, you know, calling in and not having to use digital tools. Um, they're looking at specific states, um, specific states and sites where you can walk in um, to kind of get to those hard, core, you know, hard to reach pockets of folks that are really needing the vaccine and aren't having challenges to get it. So patience, persistence, and just hang in there. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I mean, it really is it, it, that I think that, that, the advice to, to find support or seek support the folks that that, that are you know whether more tech savvy have a better as Fern said have a better computer um you know I'm, I'm, I'm I've been I was very f glad to see my father who's 81 uh similar age to, to Fern's parents um was was recently vaccinated he lives in Connecticut um he, he's he, he's worked in healthcare as a hospital administrator running drug drug treatment centers for most of his career and about as knowledgeable about the healthcare system as a non non-doctor i think could be and and it, it was a it, it was a lot of work for him and i and even then it was you know you could go here on this date and here this date and that's a long trip and he's again 81 uh, and, and finally found uh or got had access to to a shot at the about 30 minutes from his home at, at Yale New Haven Hospital. Um, but, but largely, I think, just because of the cons some, some consulting work he'd done through Yale that he even learned about that opportunity. So it really is, uh, it's really a, really an effort to, to get that uh, figured out. So, so thank you. Um, so I think, uh, Fern, I, I wanted to, I know there have been lots of questions coming in and, and thank you for uh, kind of monitoring the, the chat while, while I was, uh, Talk, ha having this discussion, so maybe I'll, I'll turn it back to you. I know there are some questions about uh, employer liability, um, so maybe, maybe if you can speak to those before we wrap up, that'd be great. Sure. Um, so there is a um, federal statute called the PREP Act, which provides uh, pretty broad liability for companies uh, who offer vaccinations for their employees as a host um, whether they are um, the authorized distributor through the county or they bring in a third party to give the vaccinations on their property to employees or um, for the nursing homes for their, their residents. Um, it's very broad liability. Um, this is part of a national program for um, injuries from lots of other vaccines, not just this vaccine. And if you're interested, um, feel free to email me and I can follow up with you on the details of that. Um, if you make the vaccine mandatory, um, uh, while you may not have liability for the injury, it may be a valid workers' comp claim if you make it mandatory. mandatory. So, for example, if you had an employee who had to travel to a foreign country for work and they got the vaccination and they had a bad reaction, that's potentially a workers' comp claim. 
Um, whether or not it's recordable or reportable to OSHA is very state specific. Um, we just got in a question about um, worker relatedness. We're happy to share with you um, some resources that we have and we will follow up with you um, uh, by email. Um, yeah, that's a that that that's a webinar. It has been a webinar in and of itself. Uh, needs right. to say a, a a conundrum uh, or an enigma wrapped inside of a riddle, so to speak. Um, we that is one of the issues. Rest assured, also that we are um, intend to comment on uh, to OSHA as part of our coalition with respect to to the uh, anticipated emergency standard. Um, be, because of the, the challenges that employers face in, in making that determination. Um, uh, we, we will, um, if we haven't gotten to, and again, I know Fern, you've been diligently, but looks like responding to a lot of these questions. If we haven't gotten to your question, uh, we, we, we will attempt to do so after. Um, in the in the in the next day or so, just know that that like you all, I'm sure we, we are we're, we're dealing with lots of fires, uh, trying to put them out, or or <laughs> lots of freezes, trying to warm them up uh, right now. So we will do our best to get get back to you. Um, I, I think that uh, Fern, I, when you mentioned broad liability, I think you mentioned you you meant broad immunity. Uh, yes, thank you. One one question, uh, but so, so yes, thanks for that clarification to to the person who, who thank who, you, Beth, who raised uh, that. Um, yeah, I, I think that that it, it's as Fern said, as Fern as you said, I think it's an important point though that that to the extent there is immunity from uh, you know consequences, health consequences, there still may, still may be that that could be recordable on an OSHA log if it is mandated. Uh, it could possibly be you know a workers' comp issue, but I think the the, the thought with the liability or the immunity here is that it would not you, you would not be subject to to litigation outside of, of those uh, other systems. Um, probably not. Yeah. Um, probably not. So, um, oh, right. And um, uh, we also just got a couple of questions about giving people time off. Um, the federal agencies have different policies about whether or not the federal employees can take time off in order to get vaccinated and the congressional delegations for DC uh, for Maryland and Virginia recently wrote to OSHA and um, the um, uh, asking if there would be a policy for and I think there's also some sort of federal department for um, uh, labor relations, and they asked if there would be a national policy on allowing federal employees to take paid time off to go get their vaccinations. So um, this is moving really, really quickly. Feel free to email us, and we'll be happy to follow up with you. Yeah, I think that's that's gonna you're you're gonna see a lot. As Fern, as Fern said, you're gonna see a lot of a lot of a lot of movement in this area. Um, I I, I, I'm, I can guarantee that that there are. There are folks that are are pushing for for some inclusion in that in in the federal standard to that regard in terms of requiring either employees to employers to provide uh, paid time off for for people to get vaccinated, uh, you know perhaps analogous to what we we've, we've seen in California's standard with respect to paid time off to get testing in, in, in when there's an outbreak. Um, so so we'll be we'll obviously be watching that um, and 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 if not. A mandate, uh, certainly, as Fern talked about, the pledge that the Biden administration is asking employers to take. So I, I expect if if it's not employers like many, at least that we're seeing right now in the meat processing industry that are are attempting to to stand up their own vaccination programs, uh, I imagine there will be a lot of employers, at least you know those that are able to, that will be providing uh, paid time off or leave or of some sort to, to obtain that vaccination. Uh, and certainly if it's done through a voucher program or, or through a, a, a partnership with a company like Walgreens or, or, or other entities where there is that kind of ready, ready access where the person won't have to wait two or three hours to get the vaccine. I think all that will make it that much easier. Um, so, so with that, um, I, I will, I, I don't know if any of the panelists have anything else that they would, would like to add or, or share before we, we wrap up. Um, I will, I'll, I'll, oh, the mics are open, so feel free to, to do that if you want. Um, if not, then I will just, uh, reference here again. I think everyone's probably familiar. We, we, we've created a, 
uh, pretty much all hands on deck uh, from COVID-19 task force. Uh, there's a section on our website that, that where we're compiling uh, all that information and updating it as best we're able. Uh, so take a look at that. Um, please check out our OSHA defense report, our employer defense report, our blogs uh, for, for additional information. And um, I think that covers it. So uh, thank you again. I really do. I, I can't thank enough our, our speakers. Lori, uh, your perspective from, from NACHO is, is really interesting. Uh, and I, I think that, that the information you shared about the channels of distribution and, and the allotment will hopefully you know, help, help everyone really understand uh, you know, the, the, both the magnitude of this effort and all the, the pieces that go into it. Uh, and Michelle and, and Sonali, thank you uh, both for your for your partnership as well as as uh, your leadership in, in this very important initiative. So thank you, uh, and thank you to Fern for for helping uh, with all the all the, the vaccine expertise. We we appreciate it. So with that, I think we will uh, we will uh, we we didn't talk, Fern. I guess at the beginning about kind of the the, the rules of order of this this event in terms of a, a, sh a safe space of sharing information. So we didn't follow our, our form formal rules of order. But I will uh, I will now call for this meeting to come to a close and, and thank everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs>